Hello everyone, I'm uh, Neil Burford, I'm a uh, lecturer in uh, architecture and, and planning. I'd just like to welcome everyone to this, uh, which I think is probably the first conference that we've run within the School of the Environment on climate change and uh, uh, the sustainable built environment. And the idea behind this is uh, something that uh, Dr. Hussam al Ware has put together um, over the course of the summer. And the idea was to uh, put together a kind of provocative series of uh, uh, speakers and uh, topics to look at the, the broad issues cross-cutting the built environment in terms of the changes we need to make to get ourselves to a more sustainable future. Uh, so it ranges from uh, looking at the issues to do with climate change, where we are now, where perhaps we will go if we're carrying on with our current practices, and where, what we need to do if we're going to change our practices to, to reduce the effects on the environment that we're creating at the moment. Right through to looking at the scale of cities and regions as uh, sustainable entities, uh, to the micro scale of uh, buildings as sustainable uh, low carbon, low energy buildings, and what the challenges are, uh, the, the current practices, and, and the changes we need to make to what we're doing. So I don't think I really want to say very much more than that, uh, because I think we've got two days of uh, very interesting talks coming up. Uh, we'll, we have a number of sessions that are themed around uh, uh, four uh, different uh, themes this morning, is uh, climate change, um, uh, and it's chaired by uh, Professor Deborah Peel uh, from Architecture and Planning, Professor of Architecture and Planning. Uh, and we'll have uh, uh, three talks this morning. Um, I think, have we arranged <coughs> for uh, questions after each talk, Deborah? Uh, we're going to have a panel question after everyone's spoken. Right, okay. So I think without further ado, um, I'll hand over to uh, Deborah mm -hmm. to do the introduction. All right, thanks, Thank Neil. Well, fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as, uh, as Neil said, my, my name is uh, Deborah Peel. And I know some of you I primarily know um, the planners here. I'll just have a quick drink. And um, uh, I was very interested when Hussain said to me, uh, uh, Deborah, you're to do an opening provocation. And you think, you know, what, does a, you know, what is a provocation? How provoking are we going to be? And so I had an opportunity to speak with the presenters this morning. And interestingly, in one way or another, they all have a background or a training and expertise in planning and forecasting. And I think the extent to which that's crystal ball gazing or backed up with evidence is, is something that's, that's very important. And interesting that your, your, your training, your professional expertise, is that an idea of looking forward. Um, I'm really impressed that uh, today's session is in a very important week uh, because many of you, if you've been following uh, the media, uh, probably saw last weekend, I don't know if any of you were involved, in some of the demonstrations in the major cities uh, across the world. May I ask if any of you were part of those demonstrations? Alex was. Were you in Edinburgh then? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, a huge interest, a growing public awareness that climate change is happening and that we need to do something uh, to address that. And so congratulations, Hussain and Neil, uh, for actually designing, thinking about this conference uh, in the same week uh, that in New York, the world's leaders, the political leaders who have the clout and the power and the authority to be able to make a change have actually met and discussed some of those ideas. And I thought, uh, you know, perhaps it would be helpful uh, if we began with a bit of luck by just watching uh, the video that all of those public leaders would have seen. One day, 
we will wake up to find that the energy that powers the alarm clock came from the breeze through the trees the night before. And we will go to work that morning riding the rays of the sun. It will light our cities and power our businesses. It will warm our homes and cool our workplaces. It will reduce sources of conflict and fuel our economies. It will connect us all. It won't scar the land or poison the seas. The food we eat will be good for our bodies and good for the planet. And the weather that day won't make us worry for tomorrow. There will be more jobs and less disease. The sea level will stop rising. And species will stop dying. The question is, how did we get to that day from where we are today? All 7.3 billion of us. We start by deciding that beyond our doubts and differences, such a day truly exists. And that is something each of us can do today. We can make today the day we stop thinking that the changes required to get there are impossible and beyond us and start realizing that they are not only possible, but what the future requires of us. We must stop turning from the warnings of science and fear and denial and instead turn toward the solutions and partnerships we need. We can make today the day we stop pointing at each other in blame and instead chart a new course together. We have never faced a crisis this big, but we have never had a better opportunity to solve it. We have everything we need to wake up to a different kind of world. We need our leaders to be brave and their choices to be bold. Okay, so there the UN is talking about the political leaders, the world leaders, but one They of will things... either remember us as the generation that destroyed its home or the one that finally came to respect it. We have every reason in the world to act. We can't wait until tomorrow. This is our only home. You can choose today to make a world of difference. down to you as early professionals, as people who are trying to seek knowledge. <coughs> Let's just close that down. So you're the ones trying to think of the, the, the knowledge that we actually need in order to be able to address some of those issues as professionals. The fact that you're studying at the University of Dundee is very important because the university sees itself very much as at the forefront of thinking how we're going to transition to a new world, how we're going to transform lives locally and globally. So the context in which you are studying is very much where we're trying to bring uh, research and good teaching practice together. And critically, the university is committed to promoting these three areas the sustainable use of global resources, thinking about how we might be able to shape, in our context, the built environment through innovative design, but ultimately to be working with people and thinking about how we can contribute to individuals' uh, well-being. And the university recognises that we can only do that by bringing different programmes and courses and students and professionals together. 
you're going to have, uh, in the course of the next two days, input from different uh, research areas across the university. The Centre for Environmental Change and Human Resilience is cross-cutting across the university, trying to bring together different expertise. I'm associated with that, but I primarily work within the Geddes Institute for Urban and Rural Research. And Patrick Geddes, interestingly, was a, a, a professor of, of botany here at the university. And he had very strong ideas about um, how to deal with particular places, how to work with the grain of places, how to think about this, the city as an evolving, a transforming place. So it's very important that we also think about how we manage the current grain of cities and places. Find the evidence, you know, work with Dundee, work with Tayplan to think about you know, how we can uh, change the approaches that we adopt the designs that we use. Patrick Geddes, before his time really, writing a hundred years ago in Cities and Evolution, was right at the heart of thinking about how everything is integrated in terms of where people work, where people live, and, and how they interact socially. And in many ways, his idea's little mantra of workplace folk captures those ideas of sustainability around economic development, economic growth, the environment and people, that social dimension. When we're thinking about sustainability, those pillars of economy, environment and society. Another of Patrick Geddes' ideas which helped shape some of the thinking within the Geddes Institute is this idea that uh, regions are comprised of cities and the surrounding landscape, the idea of town and country, the idea of conurbation. So when we're thinking about climate change, we're trying to think of the interrelationships of town and country, the interrelationships of, of different areas of expertise. And Geddes argued that it takes a whole uh, set of occupations working together to make the city region work. And increasingly today, we're seeing that interprofessional working is absolutely vital. So my provocation would be that the evidence is here, I'm looking to Alex for that, that the evidence is here that, that clim climate change is happening. It's happening now and that there is uh, an imperative for us as a society, uh, as nascent professionals, to think about how we're going to deal with that. So whose responsibility is it? Well, I think it's ours. I think it's ours individually. Uh, I, I think it's ours professionally. So it's, my question to you will be, you know, what will you do personally and professionally to address the negative effects of climate change? And where will you act? Will it be locally or globally? Will you act at the local scale, the strategic scale, the national scale? Or are you planning careers internationally? Because some of the people speaking uh, at the UN summit were speaking from the islands like the Maldives or the Bahamas, where the situation is very dramatic and very different. And whose name will you act in? You know, why will you do these things? Who will you do it for? Will you be conscious of the power dynamics that climate change means for different communities, different communities of interest? So how will you work with those different stakeholders? And ultimately, how will you work with different professionals? This morning's speakers, as I said, all have different backgrounds in, in, in planning and meteorology. But the important thing is that they will each tell you that they don't work in a silo. They reach out, they stretch out, and they work with other people. So my provocation to you is to think about how you blend your specialist areas of expertise with that general need to work together. And with that, Alex, I'm going to uh, invite you to, to move over to the the hot table, and I will just find your presentation for you. Is, that, did we put yes, them in? Yes. Is it just here? That's what yes. <laughs> and what I'm not going to do, um, colleagues, is, is give you a, a long bio of each of our speakers, uh, because we've actually produced that information for you, so I think we'll focus on the presentations. Thank you. Good morning. Are we all well this fine morning? <laughs> You've survived it. You got through the night and you're here. Um, fascinating introduction and it suddenly struck me just, just, just listening to what the professor was saying. 
If you go back to Geddes and think about a city, you go back and look at London. I've walked in London for 20 years. London's a little box. It's got a motorway around it called the M25, and it's got a green belt around it. And that's a significant, simple way of looking at the kind of things Geddes was talking about. But actually, I want you to think, first of all, before we get to that, about the global city. Because we live in a global city now. Everything you do is dependent, not what happens in Dundee or Edinburgh or London, just as important as Shanghai, Brasilia, etc. Et so you've got to keep that local right the way up to that monstrous thing in your head. And it's not an easy thing to do. Particularly, um, uh, Professor, I had a quick chat about this this morning, um, when the world is full of experts. We have far too many experts in the world. We need more people that talk between experts and actually have experts uh, up and running because experts just confuse you. I'm just an ordinary sort of guy, I'm just a weather forecaster, and every time I talk to an expert, I fall asleep. So this is not about expertise, it's about understanding. It's about how you think and how you think outside that silo that has been created for you by experts. And I'll leave you with that thought to go on to really the proper stuff. Um, so, oh, get the right button. Right, this is what we're going to talk about. We did a little bit about perspective. All the stuff that's come out from the IPCC in the last year or so, since last September, I will run through that fairly quickly. Then we're going to have a quick look at Scotland and the kind of implications for that. Um, I'll then a few thoughts on where we can go from here. How does that sound? Any thoughts on that? Everybody happy with that? Perfect. Okay, right. Doesn't say very much. Okay, here's the scary statement, and I want you to keep this in your head betwixt now and the end. There is nothing you do day or night that I don't have something to do with. Be afraid. Be very afraid. What did you do first thing this morning? It's the first thing you did. Guy with glasses and a beard. That's uh, what I did. I put on my kettle and uh -huh. some coffee. Uh -huh. So you had water, water electricity, yeah. coffee. Toaster. Perfect. You toast? Yeah, right. How many weather forecasts do you think are in those four things? Think about it. Energy, the amount of energy that flows through the pipes and the wires in the UK is dependent upon a weather forecast. I used to do that weather forecast when I was head on the weather side. If I got the forecast 48 hours, 48 hours ahead wrong, my team got the forecast 48 hours ahead wrong by more than two degrees, I had to write a letter of apology to the managing director of the energy companies. Because it cost them a bloody fortune. So I'm only with gas. Was that the next thing you did? You did water. Uh, yeah. What's the biggest CO2 producer in Scotland? Biggest single CO2 producer in Scotland is Scottish water. Moving all that water around is a hugely complex and energy uh, powerful thing. And again, we do well for cash for them. Farmers, for your, your cup of tea, and we'll come to coffee later because coffee is crucial uh, to, to keep me alive, if nothing else. So, no matter what you do, then you get out, you get on a bus. Where's the oil come from? The energy come from? North Sea. I've got forecasters now sitting out in the North Sea. I've got forecasters now sitting in the South China Seas with oil companies. Renewable energy companies, it's the first thing they do. They ask a meteorologist or a climatologist, what's the weather like? So before you're even out the house and coming to, to think and work in a place like this, you've used half a dozen weather forecasts. And in a normal day, you probably use about 15 or 20. So when I get it wrong as a forecaster, it's you guys that impact on it. Which brings me right back to thinking about what you do, how we do it, and what climate change looks like. And I suppose the first thing to say is most of you are relatively young. Well, certainly relative to me, virtually everybody is. But um, I normally start off when, when I talk to you by apologising. Um, it's my generation and my parents' generation that have got us into this mess. Unfortunately, it's you lot that's got sorted out. And that's what the next 40, 35 minutes is really about. How to think about sorting it out. Okay? Right. Okay, stage one. Evidence. Everything's about evidence. If you're a climate skeptic, you pick and choose your start and finish points along this graph that says global warming has stopped. See, if you go from this point here, around about 2003, to this point here, around about 2012, 
it hasn't. You know, Bob's not warm up. These are American figures, by the way. They're not, uh, they're not uh, Met Office figures, so I'm not trying to boast about that. And you could do that all the way back. That, was back. that graph was back to 1970, so it's a little bit strange. However, anybody with half a brain who knows anything about statistics looks at that, which is the long term, and this is what climate's about. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. It's not about the last 5, 10, 15. Keep that in your head to start with, and you won't make a mistake. It's the same data, but it's understanding it and how you perceive it that matters. And from that period, last 35 years or so, um, it's been a steady rise. Ups and downs as you go along the way, but it's a steady rise. You don't need to take notes, by the way, that all this graph stuff will be available to you, because um, I've left you with a PDF. And then, what's it ha what, what happens? What does it mean to actually, you know, if you have a mistake like this, you're going to be up. So, say, you're chief police officers of Scotland. Um, at that time, it was eight very tall, grizzled, grey-haired men. They were very scary, um, and they, they were asked by the Scottish Government just, just before I came up here, came back from London, um, what impact does climate change have on you? What impact is it like that? And this is what they came up with. Uh, the effects of climate change, but like crystal ball gazing with some widespread and varying predictions for the future. <coughs> okay, but do I look like Mystic Meg? Let's be honest. You know, I am not that way. Yeah, yeah, they have a point. I mean, it is complex and it is difficult, and thinking about it is complex and difficult. Doesn't mean to say you don't think about it. So I went in and I did a bit of chat with them and all the rest of it, and I've done lots of stuff with them since then. Unfortunately, that's what happened. The reality is, yes, the science is difficult. No doubt about it. The impact of the science is blatantly obvious. And it's blatantly obvious in surprising places like Kilburnley's police station. Um, it's not easy. So, it, within that kind of context, we need to start thinking a little bit more now about what the world looks like. This is from uh, IPCC. This is them looking at the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is actual measurements. And it goes back to 1960, as you can see. And there's been a steady rise. Little wiggles on the way up, but it's been a steady rise. And as that happens, we hit, um, this year, we hit the, the, the magic uh, 400 parts per million. And that's just carbon dioxide, remember, that's not carbon dioxide equivalent, so there's no mention here of methane or anything else, nitrous oxide or anything else in the atmosphere. This is just the CO2. Which is fine, because it just was a nice, gradual, gentle curve. But when you look back over the last 800,000 years or so, well, there's a previous high, around about 300 parts per million. There's where we are now. That gap is enormous, and the speed of that rise is unprecedented. And it's that that's the problem. It's too quick. We cannot cope with it. Neither our natural or even our human systems can cope with it. So we need to think how much more of this can the planet put up with. And this is what the IPCC have done. They've looked at, we were used to dealing with scenarios which are annual outputs, but they've started to think much more now about cumulative outputs. How much carbon dioxide lingers in the atmosphere over a longer period of time. And what we need to do to get below this magic 2 degrees Celsius rise. So they came up with these uh, cumulative emission scenarios. The worst one is sort of 8.5 right there at the bottom, and that's a nightmare alley because your temperature rise by the end of the century is at least 4 degrees Celsius. And that's not a pleasant place to be. So depending on how we behave globally decides what the planet looks like in 100 years' time. It's not my problem. I'll be dead. But my grandkids might still be around. Your grandkids will certainly be around. That's the thinking processes that human beings are not very good at. Our normal thinking processes are what we're going to have for breakfast. Which bus am I going to get into town? What am I going to do tomorrow? Maybe next week. What's my holiday going to be next year? That's about the, the biggest, longest time scale we think about. They don't think 10, 15, 20, 100 years ahead. That's the hardest bit. Someone who designs a building, however, needs to think about that. Still using the Fourth Road Bridge, it's what, 100 and odd years old, 150 years old? Fourth Road Bridge? Still using it. That's the kind of time scales we need to start thinking about them or not. 
We've got shock terrorism and the wonderful phrase that I heard mentioned, that sustainable growth. Sustainable growth is an oxymoron. It cannot happen. It's impossible. Read uh, Tim Jackson's book. If you ever read one book this year, read Tim Jackson's book, Sustainability Without Growth. Take it down. That's the one thing you're allowed to write down. Read that book, and then panic. Okay, so this is what we need to do. We need to have two degrees C rise, keep it below that. We need to limit the total output to about a thousand gigatons to have a two to one chance of keeping the temperatures at two degrees Celsius. What does that mean? Well, it means so far we've got a difficult world to deal with. What the world looks like in 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 years time is increasingly at risk. So if we take a quick look at the world, this is what it kind of looks like. This is, ER, this is the working group too. And again, remember, we do a global thing. Um, any of the solid symbols you see there are dangerous. Any of the little ones that have got spaces in them are, are not quite so dangerous. So let's just pick that area to begin with. Looking at the physical system, great glaciers and snow and rainfall, big changes across Europe. Big problem. Biological systems, this is what you rely on, this is the air you breathe, the food you eat. Huge changes, forest fires, fisheries, human beings, the law across Europe. And this is huge damage to the marine ecosystem. If you increase the acidity in the water, crustaceans lose their shells, when they lose their shells you break the food chain, which means no more cotton chips on a Friday night. It's kind of a difficult concept to realise, but you get rid of mollusks, you get rid of everything else in the food chain. So just a simple thing like that can cause you a problem. And then we have our human money systems. These are the things that we do. Food production, human beings. And again, when you see around Europe, various places where it's particularly complicated. Now, as I said, this stuff is readily available. So you can have a look at it yourself while you're thinking about it. But just to give you a clearer example of the, the long term, this is some work done on major crop production, producing areas around the world. Now, for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you lose as much areas to grow corn and as gain because of the changes in the climate. But the further on you go, that balance gets less and less realisable. Therefore, you start to decrease yield dramatically in lots of different places. And if we're thinking about nine and a half billion people on the planet by 2050, I don't think we can afford this, can we? No? We're all just going to let them just sort of quietly start up the day. So, health, hugely important for everybody. By the 2050s, the implication of working group two is that what you'll see is more of what we've got. In other words, we will see more extremes, we'll see more people having stressful lives because of it, and in the Western world in particular, it will become increasingly complex. And the confidence in that is very high. 2100, this is when it starts to become again quite difficult. What happens when sleeping sickness, dengue fever, violence disease move north of the Alps? You get dengue fever north of the Alps, it hasn't been north of the Alps ever. Remember Blue Tongue? Why do you think Blue Tongue turned up? Blue Tongue turned up because the frost that normally killed the little tick that brings it didn't arrive. Blue Tongue's been endemic in Central Europe for as long as I can remember, but it's never got across the channel because our weather killed it. Now, unfortunately, it didn't on this occasion, and you ask any farmer about the damage that's done. So, essentially, we need to be focused on the risks. We need to be focused on the increased variability of our weather and when you're designing something, think outside the box a little bit. And we need to think about in how the future infrastructure will look for all of us, not just for, for thee and me, but how far ahead it looks. Things that we rely on now will no longer be available. Things that we don't know will happen, will happen, you know, no unknowns, known unknowns, etc., etc., all that kind of nonsense. But think back 100 years and think what it looked like 100 years ago. And then think about what it's like now. Just before, say, let's say just before the First World War, Neil Gunn was writing his books and uh, all these things were going on. 
the world that we lived in was, the UK particularly, was largely agricultural. Yes, there was industries, but we got increasingly city-bound thereafter. And we become increasingly reliant on exporting manufacturing and food production to other countries, other parts of the empire as it was. So that pattern changed quite quickly in 100 years. What's the next 100 years going to look like? Where will technologies take us? Do we really know? Do we really need to think about it? Yes, is the answer. So third part of this is working group three, which is the sort of general summary. Lots of things are still uncertain. The crucial one is one, two, three down there. Very unlikely to stay below two degrees Celsius without carbon capture and storage. While we run a, an energy system that is highly reliant on carbon fuels of all sorts, then we're not going to stay below two degrees Celsius. That's the problem area. As soon as we start to get above two degrees Celsius by the end of the planet, by the end of the, the, the century, things get very, very difficult. So I want you to think about this. It's just a, a, a sort of limited output from a uh, two degree C temperature rise. This is roughly what it looks like. Just, there are other things to look at, but this is just a few of them. We just cops in Southeast Asia. Forest fires in, in South America, in South Africa. Some increase in crops. Remember we saw that in the early stages about the, 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 uh, the food increase. We're going to get some increase across Europe because it's warmer, because the rain falls a bit better. Increasing ice melting in, in Greenland. Um, lecture on that. They've already had, well, well, it takes about six hours to do it well. Um, ocean acidification. Again, think about what you, you had from stuff up this morning. Heat waves in the US. That's where the two degree C rise. There's a lot more detail built into this map, and you can see it on the Met Office website. Get to four degrees Celsius, it becomes really quite scary. <coughs> Ocean acidification continues, obviously. You start to lose rainforests, tropical storms increase, reduce crops in Southeast Asia, and increase trade. Where the majority of the population in the world live? Anybody know? Correct. Don't start a tick to her, how was that? But if you go back two years, the ODI Overseas Development Institute uh, produced a paper on uh, rice production. And in 2012, China exported no rice at all because they had a drought. Now that doesn't going to affect you or me very much because of the way we live in a little bit closed society. The guys in India were over the moon because Bashmati rice suddenly became doubled in value. But you start to expand that across the whole of the world and try to feed 9 billion people, this isn't going to be easy to do. And that's the problem. It's that interlinking. Especially when you start to think about increased trade in Central Europe. The breadbasket of, of, of uh, much of our country. And similarly with uh, the US bread basket in the world in many places. So, here's your supply chain. This is just your lunch, by the way. Isn't it? Oh, bigger supply chains than that. Farmer at that end. You as the consumer at this end. And you see all the stages in between. And each one of them, you will find there's an impact from climate change. The farmer's going to see an impact because of reductions or increases in water flow. Research centres are going to have to think very carefully about what you do about the biosphere. Chemical industry, can we afford? Oil is used, one of the biggest usages of oil in the world is making fertilizer. Can we afford to continue to do that? I don't know. Then you've got all your transport organisations, well, your exporters, all the rest of it, manufacturing processing. Here's a crazy figure for you. Northern Ireland exports 400,000 chicken breasts Every month. Okay? No, every, every month, I can't remember. Anyway, the number is 400,000. Okay, Over the same period of time, they import 420,000. Now, is that bonkers or what? This is the society we have created for ourselves. We are cheaper to send things out to Poland in a lorry, get it processed over there, put it in a bag, bring that bag back to the UK. And then you go into the supermarket and buy your, your, your chicken tikka masala. It's bonkers, it's got to stop. And this whole structure is how we have managed to create that problem. And everybody talks to me about shaving. The reason I say to you don't shave 
He said, I'm going to do that very quickly, very quickly, right. You see these little um, Gillette disposable razors, big razors, right? You see, not Gillette, the best a man can get off, get all that kind of crap. Um, these are made in Guangdong in China. Think about it. You've got plastic, you've got steel. This plastic's made from oil. Um, the steel is, uses a lot of energy to make it. They used to import the steel from New Zealand, but they make their own now. It's a coal power station that gets the whole system up and running anyway. So they get 10 of these, you put them in a bag. The bag goes in the box, the box goes in another box. That box then goes in a container. The container goes in the back of a boat. The boat travels 8,000 miles across the planet, comes into Tilbury Docks. The container comes off, goes the back of a lorry, travels all around the country dropping off these boxes and bags. You go in and say, hmm, right, okay. And you go and you buy a bag of big razors. Use it for two weeks, and what do you do with it? You chuck it in the bin. And if your partner happens to have shaved their legs with it, then you know, it's, it'll last about a week and a half. <laughs> the whole point being, that's the society we created. It's a disposable item. The carbon cost of that is bloody enormous. It's ludicrous. My grandfather, who fought in the First World War, was given, before he went to fight in the saw, a cut for a razor. He used it for his entire life. It's the nature of society that we have created for ourselves that causes the problem. Anyway, enough lecture. Um, just to show you very quickly, one of my favourite groups, this is, this is the uh, Winemakers Association, PNES.org, um, and they looked at 2050, what happens if we increase temperatures enough? And my, uh, I have a weakness for good wine. That's Rioja Don, uh, Bordeaux just about finished, but all my favourite Italian wine, the most expensive wine out of Italy, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I get one bottle a month, otherwise I get shot by my wine. Um, that's gone. Uh, Bull's blood from Hungary, these are areas, that's gone because they can't grow the grapes anymore. Um, your South African cheap old stuff, that's gone as well. This is not me saying this, this is PNAS.org. It's horrendous. Imagine that, no more Rioja. You'll hate yourself. Coffee, again, another sustainable thing. This is, this is Uganda. 38% of Uganda's population rely upon the food crop, and that food crop is coffee. A robust of coffee bean. This is work done by the United Nations Environment Programme. The two degree sea rise in Uganda, the virtually the economy collapses in its entirety because you can't produce those coffee beans anymore. And that's just insane. You have an idea what it takes to make a cup of coffee. 90,000 litres of water to make one kilogram of coffee. That's quite heavy, it's a lot of water to shift around. It's a kilowatt hour of energy just to make one cup. No, I'm not saying you should all stop drinking coffee and you then need to find a better way of doing it. And that's not for me again, that's from the coffee guide, the organisation. How are we doing for time? Not bad. How long have we got? Yeah, we've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Looking at Scotland then, this is the work, the work I've been doing with, a lot of the work I've been doing with the Scottish Government is based on, on, on this kind of stuff. So now at that end is the, all the, the temperature stuff, the rainfall, all the rest of it. That's relatively easy to do. It gets more difficult when you get over to where you look at the impact where you need to make changes, both in terms of reducing CO2 output from each of these activities and making them sustainable in the longer term, making them climate proof, if you like. Now, the big problem is that in keeping with all civil servants, and I'm a civil servant, well, I was a civil servant up until last Friday when I retired, we like things in boxes. We love it when somebody says, well, there's your wee bit. Go and do that. that might be right back to that whole thing about synergy, right back to that whole thing about getting rid of experts. We all love our experts because they give us wee boxes and we need to get shot in these boxes. I don't see how you can talk about agriculture without talking about biodiversity. I don't see how you can talk about built environment without thinking about energy, well-being, spatial planning and land use. Transport. These things are not mutually exclusive. They must work together. And your jobs as planners in the long run will be to see that this stops. That you actually start to join these dots together. Because without that, we're in a bit of a problem. Yeah. It needs to be thought much more clearly. How can you do emergency services without thinking about water resources? How can you do agriculture without water resources? How can you do business and industry without looking at the built environment. You cannot separate these things. So if you want your PhD, join all up. There you go. There's a challenge for you.
Try and get the links between these things. And there may be a reasonable link simply looking at weather and climate change. And that's my suggestion to you. Um, agriculture, you can link these things together quite carefully. And using climate change as a bedrock or as a glue, using weather and climate as a glue between all these different things, you can actually begin to get some kind of synergy. So what does it mean? What will Scotland look like? If anybody's got the tune for this, by the way, please send it to me. Not the new tune, which I hate. Horrible. The biggest tool you have at the moment is this thing, it's called UKC Bureau 9, United Kingdom Climate Projections 2009. Um, 7 terabytes of data. Be sure you know what you want to get out of it before you even switch it on, because it's a fiendishly complicated thing to get your stuff out of. Just to give you a rough idea how to do it, first thing you need to think about is how we're going to behave. How's the world going to behave? No point in thinking about how Scotland's going to behave. You need to think about how the world's going to behave. Are they going to be very good? In that case, you go for the green bit at the bottom, B1. Are we going to be, well, you know, we'll get it eventually, guys, just give us a few years, and you go for the A1B. And if you think that actually we're not getting very far, very fast, then you go for the A1FI, which is, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I hate to tell you we're on the A1FI stuff <coughs> at the moment. What else is there? You can look at timescales. Again, if you're designing a house or a building or a bridge, do you want it to last 20 years or 50 years? Would we be having uh, problems with the fourth road bridge if the designers of the fourth road bridge knew the kind of stuff that we knew now? No, we wouldn't. We wouldn't be thinking about why it's rusting inside the cables. Because we'd be a bit more aware of the moisture in the atmosphere. They should have talked to me first, but they didn't. <laughs> and then you can look at areas and regions, obviously. I would suggest you don't get too tied into a small region because it's, it's quite difficult then to. to um, to get the data useful to you, you need to think more in terms of, of reaching it. So, what does it mean? This is the kind of stuff you get. Now, here's how it works. This is our weather. We're using temperatures as, as an example. We have an average. We have top and tail. We have hots and colds. And those kind of hots and colds are the bits where we have difficulties. And it gets too cold, and you get snow, and it gets slippy, and people have to do things, or it gets too hot, and other things change. Your energy use goes up because your air conditioning goes through the roof, etc. Et et so, this is how we're used to thinking and planning within these ranges. We make a decision that says, I am prepared to say I will put up with that amount of risk. I'll say, okay, if, if it goes over that, tough, we will just have to put up with it. So that's your threshold at either end. The problem is with climate change, this is what's happening. The average isn't changing too much. Because averages, by their very nature, are slow to change. But it's the threshold values that cause problems. Again, think of the fourth row bridge. The threshold values are happening, this, this, in this case, a hot threshold, but you can use rainfall, it doesn't matter, they're all the same. As soon as you start to get more breaches of that threshold, the more your infrastructure comes under pressure. It doesn't mean to see the bottom end disappears. Because it doesn't. It just happens less frequently. That's quite a difficult thing to get your head around. Effectively what you've done is you, you've spread out the range of possibilities quite, quite considerably. And you've got this increased at one end. <coughs> so what does that look like then for Scotland? You take the warmest day, well by about 20, 25, 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50, get an extra degree or two on average on your hottest day. That puts temperature in Edinburgh at uh, the hottest day in the summer around about 30, 30 Celsius. The problem is, as you go further on, it gets more difficult. Once you get above 30, it gets much harder. And your risk of getting this really extreme temperature increases dramatically. Similarly, night time, exactly the same pattern. You see the pattern. Now, the other thing to notice is that you start to skew. It's not an even graph, the further ahead you go, it becomes less even. As it becomes less even, this top end becomes more probable. These are probability density functions, by the way, for those of you who understand that kind of stuff. I don't know, but I don't know. So what does that mean? What does it mean? This is 2003. Most of you are probably still in school. Um, I was in London at the time. Um, this is the European temperature anomalies for 2003. Now, back across history, you can see how year on year temperatures have changed in Europe. 
black line is the forecast. The black line is reality, by the way. The red line is, is the forecast, is the climate change prediction. That fits okay till we get to 2003. And 2003 goes, what? It's ridiculous. And I was in London at that time. Temperature in the Elephant and Castle tube station, which is the deepest tube station in London, reached 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Sustained temperature was dead power. And you wonder why the power went out. Because I was there. It was horrible. I've never met anything like it in my life. 60,000 people across Europe died because of the heat alone. And just to put that in perspective for you, here's the long-term average, the bottom line. If we warm up by 2 degrees C on average, you're not quite hitting that 2003 number. But by the 2040s, that becomes every second or third summer. By the 2060s, that becomes a cool summer. Do we have the infrastructure for this? Are you training for it? Are your doctors training for it? Are your transport managers training for it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The answer is probably not. So, how did it look? Well, this is actual figures for what we did with the National Health Service. The yellow line is the average number of people. It's a bit morbid. It's a, <laughs> the yellow line is the average number of people dying on a daily basis in London. The blue line is the daily deaths in that 2003 summer. The red line is the temperatures. Do you want to know what's really, really scary about that? You see that big peak that that's pointing at? That's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so for Scotland, what does it look like? Well, I think of your railway infrastructure. Just simply railway infrastructure. If you put six degrees Celsius on the maximum temperature that we have built the railway to, to cope with, you put a stake in Edinburgh, Aberdeen ends up in the North Sea because of the expansion of the rails. Glasgow to Edinburgh get even further apart. The bridge out there, your, your lovely new Dundee bridge, actually doesn't have a coast to get to. So it'll just kind of fall into the sea. All this kind of stuff that's in the background that you didn't let them up to see. Similarly, when you start to put in what cities are doing with, with heat islands, nighttime temperatures in particular are absolutely crucial for health and well-being, both of the elderly and the children. Quick look at rainfall, two minutes. Please. Quick look at rainfall. Again, the same pattern. Think about it. By the time you get to 20, what's this? 2060, 2070, 2080, depending on each, which emission scenarios, the wettest day could be 10% wetter. Actually, if we don't do something about it, it'd be 20% wetter. And the risk at the top end is 30 to 40% wetter. So, if you think about your insurance, that one on the left is what your house insurance is for. That's what, that's what you pay for, that's what you pay lawyers in London for, 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 for flood, flood insurance. So if you're building a building or designing a building, you go for this one in 30 year rainfall event. That's what most people look at. Some of the regs are different depending on which country you're in, but essentially it's that. That one in 30 year event in 50 years time, you've got to deal with at least half as much again in water. So for the, let's say for example you have 100 millimetres of water in 6 hours is what you build your, your top end to, you design to. That's not that. In 50 years' time, that'll be 150 millimetres of rain in six hours. Classic example, a friend of mine refurbished completely one of the beautiful townhouses in Edinburgh, right down to replacing the Georgian, uh, Georgian guttering. It's cast iron guttering, cost him a fortune. And then one of the and said his house was getting wet. Because Georgian guttering is only that wide. To cope with the amount of rain he's getting now, he needs guttering that wide. Simple illustration of where we're going and how bad it gets. So, we'll just skip through this next bit because I'm going to get to the last slide. These are all stuff that we can talk about. Remember these areas that we talked about. Get the carbon footprint down, go up there. And don't be this guy. You know, if you've spent your life, um, the turkey farmer would be really proud of you, guys. He's fed he's looked after you, all the rest of it. Uh, but have, if you've planned for historical information, which is like the poor turkey has by the time it comes to Christmas, what happens? Loses his head. So, to summarise it in one sentence, am I doing okay? Yes. Right, to summarise it all, all that in one sentence. That's the first line from L.P. Hartley's novel, The Go Between. The past of the foreign country, they do things differently there. My argument to you 
And my suggestion to you is that you need to think about how to do things very differently in the future. Therein lies the problem. We have the science, we have the knowledge. Yes, it's not perfect. None of it is. No science ever is. Hasn't been perfect since the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, for heaven's sake. And that's over 100 years ago. Now, however, you have a methodology for planning a future much more safely, coherently, and well understood. Something that we haven't really had for centuries. Thank you. some of the 
uh, um, things that cities are doing, uh, of what a, a city of the future might look like and what Glasgow is doing. And when I, when I arrived in Glasgow, actually, the, uh, the Mail on Sunday had run an expose. I don't know if you remember it, Alex, or anybody. Um, this, was, this was probably about uh, uh, May 2013. And it came from Nigel Lawson, who's one of the climate change deniers. And what they'd done is they'd done a freedom of information request. And they'd actually um, put the amount of money that each of these councils, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Leeds, Manchester, were all spending on this thing that didn't exist, which was climate change. Glasgow was one of the highest spending authorities on, on the staff. Uh, and they listed all of the different posts, one of which was mine, the job that I was going to uh, uh, move into, and, um, and they said, what a waste of money. But to its credit, Glasgow, and I know many other authorities like Dundee uh, and Edinburgh, many Scottish cities, are all committed now to this uh, uh, climate change agenda. And, and broader from that, because Hassan's asked me to talk about the Energy and Carbon Master Plan, and, and again, you know, picking up on Deborah's points, you know, for the courses that you're doing, your master's courses, I can see you actually doing these within places like Glasgow and Dundee and Edinburgh and Aberdeen in the future. And then just to remind us that we're actually um, on the right lines with this, I want to just give you some of the citizen and stakeholder views that we've collected in the process of developing the Energy and Carbon Master Plan for Glasgow. Um, so I think you know, and it's been mentioned already, that half the world's population lives in cities today. So that figure was in the video right at the beginning. So over three and a half billion people live in uh, uh, cities today. And that, that is growing and continues to grow. People are attracting. And that's the major growth, actually, in the developing world, as Alex was uh, pointing out earlier. Um, and nearly two thirds of the world population will reside in urban areas by 2040. Cities consume 80% of the world's energy and also produce about 75% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if I recommend, one, the one book I would recommend <laughs> actually is If Mayors Ruled the World um, by Benjamin Barber. He actually came and talked to a conference that I was at, which was an Energy Cities conference in, in Brussels um, earlier this year. This is a very accessible book. Um, he makes the argument that we're not actually governing this issue of uh, climate change at the right sort of level, and this is great wealth for uh, mayors uh, who were joined together in a parliament of, of mayors. So the subtitle of this is, if mayors re rule the world, dysfunctional nations rise in cities. So that just reinforces the point that we need to look at how mayors in, in, in many cities, uh, like New York and London and, uh, and, and other cities, all need to work together. And, and there are encouraging signs that they're beginning to do that. Actually, in New York, it was quite interesting, in uh, David Cameron's little faux pas, really, yeah. he was actually talking to Mayor Bloomberg, actually. So yes. it shows that these are now becoming very uh, prestigious figures, I think, the mayors of, uh, of the world's major cities. So the en energy challenge for cities, what do cities need to do? Well, they need to meet the growing energy needs of a rising population. We were talking about uh, scenarios, actually. Part of the step-up work that we've been doing is looking at uh, some scenarios, and just uh, National Grid have done some scenarios work as well, which is very good, and I, uh, again, recommend that you read that. But we've, we've done some sort of mini scenarios looking at what a growing population would mean for Glasgow's energy demand for CO2 emissions and what a declining population would mean. It's not that long ago that Glasgow's population was declining. Actually, in the scenario work that we, we were doing in, in sort of workshops, we decided that that was not good, even though we'd have lower CO2 emissions, but the investment that we'd get in new technologies would be far better if we have, a, have an increasing population, which is what we, we have in, in, in Glasgow, uh, at about 600,000 population. Um, cities need to tackle climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions for all the reasons that Alex has given us. And, and I haven't met any politician in Glasgow that disagrees uh, with this uh, um, effort that we're, we're undertaking now. We need to become more energy efficient. Uh, we need to become more energy secure um, because of the uh, where we still import a lot of gas and, and, and we're importing energy from places that are volatile and we can't guarantee that we're going to have those sorts of energy in the future. And decentralised energy is something that we want to have more of in, uh, in Glasgow and, and get away from the centralised national grid, the electricity system, 
So we want to produce more re renewable energy. We're never going to be self-sufficient in renewable energy, but um, encouraging science that you know we want more wind turbines, we want more HEP, we want more geothermal energy, and we've got plans which I'll come on to later about uh, solar PV on vacant and very little land across the city. And of course, we want to thrive economically. I'll, I'll, I'll come on to this point it's about, about sustainable growth that I'll expect up a, a little bit later. But obviously, this is the key driving force for, for our politicians, that they want Glasgow to be successful economically. And they see this agenda as actually encouraging greater uh, growth. But, but um, growth in those low-carbon uh, skills and, and, and industries, with like Guy Wind, actually, in, in Glasgow, that is manufacturing. Not long ago, but we didn't have any way that was manufacturing uh, wind turbines. That was all over in Denmark. And, and of course they want to improve the quality of life for residents and, and very much this, the work that we're doing in Step Up is about, you know, our cities are going to be better uh, by doing all of these things. So how are cities responding at the moment? If you read um, Benjamin Barber's book, he talks about, you know, Eclair, which has been going for about 20 years now, and uh, C40 Cities, the Climate Leadership Group. There's energy cities that runs across Europe, and then there's the Covenant of Mayors as well. These are all examples of how cities are actually working together horizontally um, uh, on this agenda. And these, this is slightly dated data, but you know, by 2011, 62% of the world's largest cities had adopted climate change actions. 57% had plans for greenhouse gas reductions with an emphasis on renewable energy. Places like Axo in Sweden aims to be 100% renewable. Virtually all cities in Sweden and uh, Scandinavia have, have similar sorts of uh, targets. 100% renewable energy uh, driven by 2030. Austin in, in the USA, which is one of the more progressive cities in the States, wants 100% of their own use of electricity to come from renewables. And in Hamburg, uh, they plan to reduce uh, by 80% their CO2 emissions by 2050. Of course, to sign up to the Covenant of Mayors, you have to, and quite a lot of them, uh, lots of cities have, and I'll give you the figures in a minute, you've got to commit to at least a 20% reduction in CO2 from 1990 levels by 2020. We've gone slightly beyond that. Um, so what does the city of the future look like? Well, buildings, and I'm glad a lot of you are sort of in the built environment sort of area, and our architects and all planners, because you know, and through our energy master plan work, we see the amount of energy uh, that we're using in, in heating and powering buildings. So um, buildings account for over 40% of the world's energy consumption. Um, but, you know, all of this work that's going on, passive house buildings, zero energy buildings, carbon neutral buildings. I was at a building earlier this week in Ravensburg, actually, um, run by the Building Research Establishment, where they've got a modular built house built to the highest uh, Brian standards, <coughs> but rather expensive, uh, and a demonstration house. We've got those in Glasgow as well. We've got Glasgow House, uh, which has been lived in by students actually for a year, and there's monitoring data on how they work. Uh, they, these are buildings that hardly need any heating at all. They actually use um, passive uh, solar gain, even, even heat from our own bodies, and people are living in buildings. Uh, they're so well insulated, you don't need any heating there. And as buildings are being transformed, cities and local governments will be, be looking to use more renewables for their heating and cooling purposes. And district heating systems, this is firmly on the agenda of Glasgow now, as I'll show you, thinking into our, our local development plan, looking at how we can extend the few pilot and unintegrated district heating schemes that already exist uh, across the city. Um, so we can reduce our energy use and we can uh, develop more carbon efficient heating. Um, by using natural gas, that's by and large what we're using in Glasgow at the moment, but biomass and geothermal air energy, which we're looking at in the future. Uh, in Gothenburg, one of the step up cities fulfills 80% of its heating demand from waste incineration, and they've got 90% of the coverage of district heating in their apartments. Uh, in, in Sweden, 98% or well, probably it's near 100% now of homes in Copenhagen are connected to their district heating. System. We've had a lot of visits from people from Denmark. You know, district heating is so prevalent, really. We're talking a different language, but they're very keen because they've got saturation of district heating to now help Scotland, you know, expanding district heating um, in the light of Scotland's commitments on, on uh, um, district heating. Uh, Munich is already meeting 8% of its heating needs via geothermal sources. We have a very small uh, mine, uh, uh, old coal mine working. Uh, 
uh, heating scheme in uh, Shettleston in, in the east end of Glasgow, which only uh, heats about um, 16 or 17 homes actually, but their uh, heating bills are half of what they might be expecting, and that's a very deprived area of Glasgow. Uh, these are some of the targets that are being set by these cities. These are the step up cities that we work with Gothenburg, Ghent, and Riga. Um, I'm, uh, I can see, you can see that these other cities that we're working with have more ambitious targets than us, but in the work that we've been doing, I think we've used the evidence to look at where we are and, and how much we've got to do to even meet our 30 percent reduction target, although Gothenburg are talking about 75% per capita reduction in CO2 by 2050. Ghent wants to be climate neutral by 2050, and Riga are reducing their CO2 uh, emissions by 55 to 60%. By, by 2020, and we're all now producing our master plans and climate strategies as sustainable energy action plans. Um, Gothenburg Energy, um, <coughs> this is just where, and I know the Association of Public Service Excellence has an initiative now to re municipalize energy. So um, things sort of uh, happened uh, a few, uh, 20 years or so ago when um, uh, the energy uh, uh, companies were privatized. Um, cities like Gothenburg run their own energy company. Uh, it was founded in 1846, and it's actually owned by the municipality. So we had we had a seminar, actually, a, a webinar recently, where we had somebody from Gothenburg Energy talking about energy services companies. So Glasgow is going to set up a similar sort of company to promote uh, district heating. Um, I mean, but this is totally owned by the municipality, so they have total control over what Gothenburg Energy actually does. Um, the way that I'm sort of trying to connect things together in, through the step-up projects in Glasgow um, is bringing together different <coughs> initiatives that the um, city has been fortunate over the past few years to get involved in. So there's the sustainable city, the smart city, and the resilient city. So, um, and, and, I, and I see these as all connected together, and this is very much linked into an EU agenda. So, a city of the future will be a sustainable city that will use less resources and produce less waste than an unsustainable city. Um, and, and, and very much, you know, the work that you will probably be doing is about the design of cities in, in the future and the buildings uh, to make them much more sustainable. Smart City will make intensive use of ICT to enhance energy efficiency uh, and uh, maximise the integration and use of renewables and ensure smart and sustainable urban transport. I'll tell you a little bit in a, in a while just about uh, the Future Cities demonstrator project that Glasgow has been involved in over the past 18 months or so. And then more recently, it's got involved in a Rockefeller Foundation initiative, which is about becoming a more resilient city. So all of the things that Alex has been talking about, um, uh, a resilient city reduces the vulnerability to extreme events and responds creatively to economic, social and environmental change in, in order to increase long-term sustainability. So on the sustainability agenda, we do this in partnership uh, under a, a board that we have with public-private uh, partners involved in that. We have the um, universities involved, we have the Chamber of Commerce, and we have the public service providers uh, involved in that, including Transport, uh, so, so, um, SBT, Stratified Passenger Transport. Uh, so, and, and this is very much um, uh, an initiative of the leadership of Glasgow to make Glasgow the most sustainable city in Europe. This is really surprising given Glasgow's history, uh, but it's part of the reinvention of Glasgow. I think that if everybody saw the Commonwealth Games, did Glasgow look good during the Commonwealth Games? Yeah, it looked pretty good, and there was a lot of work done on sustainability, on recycling, etc., and transport, uh, public transport, uh, during the time of the Games. Um, so. And it's applied to the European uh, Green Capital in the past, and it's going to have a green year next year. So it very much sees this as the new image of, of Glasgow in the future. Uh, it's, it wants a green economy, it wants to reduce carbon emissions, it wants to deliver on those social objectives, including reducing uh, fuel policy. Um, the Resilient City, we're currently using this Rockefeller Foundation, so there's uh, 100 Resilient Cities uh, Centennial Challenge, uh, which was launched in 2013. Um, 
so uh, in order to be one of those hundred uh, cities, 400 cities across six continents or five, uh, and Glasgow, Perth, it was going to be one of the first three, 33 cities selected. Um, they define resilience as the ability of a system, entity, community, or person to withstand shocks while still maintaining its essential functions and to recover quickly and effectively. The challenge that we've got, you know, just picking up on this um, silos, is that you know this this uh, may be something that maybe the emergency planning function would have done, maybe in a bit of a silo and wouldn't involve uh, other people. So the challenge for Glasgow is bringing together all of the work that we're doing across a number of different uh, areas within the council in terms of functions and bring that together under one resilience plan over the next couple of years for the city. And we have to appoint a chief resilience officer in order to do that. Um, so, many of these things Alex has already talked about in terms of the resilience of, of our city. So we have to withstand both these acute shocks, but also continue to deal with these chronic stresses. So we do have rising sea level and coastal erosion, but we still have massive problems of about a third of households uh, in Glasgow suffering from fuel, fuel poverty, we have homelessness. Uh, a lack of affordable housing in so some parts of the city, changing demographics, lack of social cohesion, we have water and air pollution, particularly in some parts of the city. We do have high unemployment. Um, and then we have these acute shocks, of which um, you know, some of the slides Alex showed, the flooding, earthquakes, heat waves, and we're planning for the far more frequent events. So these are some things that Glasgow have now to think about in terms of its resilience plan uh, for the future. Um, uh, and that includes things like terrorism and riot and, and civil unrest. And some of the stuff that we've been doing through the Future Cities demonstration is bringing an operations se centre, bringing the work on community safety through CCTV uh, together with the transport, uh, transport management uh, and, and gradually expanding that out to monitor different systems of, of how the, the um, including the emergency planning, how the city is dealing with these different issues on a real-time basis uh, across the city. Um, the smart city, um, I don't think there's any one definition, you probably find lots of definitions of the smart city. Um, I think the concept is just to make intensive use of ICT, to enhance energy efficiency, maximise integration and use of renewables and building and local electricity grid and, and also things like rolling out electric vehicles, of which Glasgow is quite keen. Um, the Future City uh, programme is something that we've uh, been involved in for a years, and it's just running to its end now. Uh, and that's about making the city smarter, safer, and more sustainable through technology. So, as I say, it focuses on the establishment of a new Glasgow Operations Centre, which is uh, monitoring um, different issues and services. Uh, uh, across the city, Open Glasgow, which is uh, um, the provision of data uh, and information to citizens and, and allowing citizens to input uh, their own data through apps. Uh, and then there's, there's a number of uh, city system integration demonstrator projects which covers active travel, energy efficiency, integrated social uh, transport and intelligent street lighting. And, uh, picking on these things, it does link, link into how that how the city needs to be functioning in the future by taking these sort of demonstrator uh, projects. So we can how we encourage people to um, be able to cycle more. We've just uh, just before the game started, we put a um, cycle mass cycle hire scheme into the city. I don't know whether anybody's been there and has seen the bikes, um, but it's just like the Boris bike scheme in London. There's been twenty thousand hires of those bikes. Um, so far, and I think a maximum of about 750 hires during the day, and, and an average of about 250 hires a day. It's been really, really successful. Energy efficiency, I mentioned in, in a while, and integrated social transport. Again, silos uh, of social care, uh, education, uh, transporting vulnerable people and children across the city, but not integrated. So that's attempted to look at how we can integrate using technology. Our use of social transport and then intelligent street lighting. Why is the street lighting on all the time? It doesn't need to be on all the time. If you're on a, on a cycleway, if a cyclist comes along and the street lighting goes on. Um, just on the step up project, um, uh, this is about creating a model for energy planning and it's built on the Covenant of Mayors um, Sustainable Energy Action Plans to deliver a greater impact on 
those EU 2020 energy targets. And, and the aim is to support a learning network for cities across Europe. So the only other place I've seen is in the US, actually, which is trying to promote this idea of energy master planning and has a manual and guidance that's available. Um, but I think it's a growing trend. And it, as I say, some of you who know is going be involved in this type of work in the future. And Kate's going to talk about this at the, at the regional level. Um, uh, and it's about professionals like yourselves getting involved in this strategic energy planning. Um, and because that will help deliver on our environmental objectives, but also on these wider policy objectives of making our cities more energy secure, reducing fuel poverty, making uh, uh, our cities greener, and, and still promoting economic regeneration. Um, the, the Sustainable Energy Action Plan, so this is the manual that was produced by the Covenant of Mayors. This was started in 2008. Uh, its main focus was supporting the 20% CO2 reduction by 2020, um, and, and this guidance enables municipalities that sign up within a year of actually making a commitment to produce their sustainable energy action. <coughs> and these guidelines were published in 2010 and now currently being updated. And there's been a massive sign up to this, uh, really, across Europe. Um, so you produce a document, uh, which is a political document. It needs to be approved by the municipal council. It's strategic, uh, design and collaboration work with stakeholders and the citizens, and it's a cornerstone for the development of other operational uh, documents as well. And for us, that will include a business plan for the operation of the energy services company. Um, uh, of that number of CAPs that are currently lodged with the Covenant of Mayors, not all of them are accept accepted. Um, they are assessed by the um, staff, uh, although in a fairly cursory way, and part of my project is seeing how we can improve this process of getting better. Um, CAPs produced, this is one from Bath and North East Somerset, uh, some of them are extremely excellent, some uh, are, uh, you could des uh, describe as PR documents really. Uh, but uh, one thing they are uh, tightening up on in the Covenant of Mayor's Office is the progress reporting and updates, uh, which are the responsibility of uh, uh, cities. Um, I don't know whether anybody saw, but in the current Economist, uh, this is the first time actually they say the Economist has actually looked linked to the uh, climate discussions that are taking place in New York at which are the policy areas and which are the initiatives that are having the highest impact on climate change mitigation in 2020. So you can see here EU renewables policy and the EU becoming up the mayor is actually listed in this, together with things like Brazil forest preservation, the point that was made um, earlier about you know, carbon sequestration being important, and China, you know, enterprise energy efficiency, China's going to have a massive impact on um, climate change mitigation uh, in, in the future. Um, and China renewables and the production of uh, you know, uh, cheap renewable technology. Um, so I think they've arrived at this, I haven't read it uh, fully. It's worth having a look at actually in reading the explanation as to how they've arrived at, uh, at these um, figures. But they, we know because each city, municipality that's committed to the government of mayors has got a target reduction, we know what that will uh, calculate. So I think that that's how they know that um, these will have a high impact on climate change mitigation. Um, the CAP process that we've been going through in Moscow is about uh, getting that political commitment, forming city administrative structures. Uh, again, you need some coordination within the, the, the council, you need to build support from stakeholders. You need to assess your current situation, you need to establish a vision, you develop the plan and you get political approval for that and then you submit uh, the CAP. Then you need to have implementation and monitoring and you want to monitor the progress. This is a very planned approach. This is what you're learning about in your master's courses about um, strategic, good strategic planning. So uh, it always used to be survey analysis plan for me. So, Sketches again. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you need to assess the current situation, you need to analyse it, and then you need to set your targets, and then you need to implement it. So if you produce your C app in 2013, you need to report on the action two years later in 2015, and then you need to do a full reporting and review uh, every four years. Um, so again, this is a typical sort of planning policy cycle that we're all familiar with from our training. Uh, so you define your vision, you establish your team, you do your baseline initiatives eventually, you develop your action plan, you implement it, and then you monitor and, and feedback. 
what we're doing in the Step Up project is seeing how we can improve that process um, by, for those municipalities that already have CAPs, looking at a gap and issue analysis so we can see whether the um, CF is actually meeting the targets or not, doing a much more thorough analysis of city energy flows using GIS, actually. Did you say, somebody, that they were doing a PhD in GIS? Was that geographic information? Uh, geography, but on climate change and water resources. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, we've made great use of G GIS in uh, our work on looking at city energy flows, setting visions and targets. And, and doing some scenario analysis as well. But these are things that were not strong in the current sort of given of mayor's process that we're uh, seeing that uh, um, how we can improve that. Um, so the process, again, typical planning process, you look at your overall strategy, you look at the baseline emissions inventory, uh, you look at developing your action plan, and there's a number of sectors that you have to set out what your key actions are, and, uh, the energy savings and the CO2 savings that you'll have from each of your actions, um, how stakeholders are, are going to be involved in that, and then each action needs to be costed and there needs to be a time frame as well. This is quite rigorous, but it's nothing to be daunted by. I think what we're doing in the Slipper project is saying that any municipality, particularly those in Scotland, could all do this. I don't think Dundee's going down that line yet, but I think it, it may do as they get more confident in the work that they're doing. A lot of Scottish cities are just looking at their own carbon management performance, i.e. their own operations, and haven't yet expanded to the city wide. Um, uh, in terms of where we, where we are in Glasgow, we know that we emitted around 4,000 kilotons of CO2 in 2006. That's our baseline, because we don't have data before that. Uh, and we know that we need to be below 3,000 kilotons by 2020. But, and we know also that our CO2 emissions reduced by 30% between uh, 2006 to 2012, so we're sort of about halfway towards our 30% reduction target. But we know from this gap here that uh, this is where we need to be and this is where we, we are now, that we have challenges from about 2013. Uh, so we need a new set of actions. Um, and in terms of this um, uh, sort of economic growth and CO2 emissions, I mean, just to plot uh, in terms of Glasgow's economic growth as measured by gross value added to GDA, which is the green line here, we've had a, seen a slight increase between 2006 and 2012 in GDA and also gross uh, disposable household income, so people getting richer and having more disposable income, which you would think means that they'll buy more appliances and there'll be more energy demand and therefore more CO2 emissions. But over that period too, there has been a decline. Obviously, the impact of the national recession that we've had um, has had an impact on that. Um, but this <coughs> idea of decoupling the economic growth from CO2 emissions is, is, is a good concept to think about. So we, you know, we've got a section in the CF that talks about that. Something that Scandinavian countries, I think, uh, I was listening to somebody from Copenhagen who showed a similar sort of graph with a much steeper incline in uh, their uh, economic growth and a much steeper decline in their CO2 emissions, but I take on board Alex's point about you can't have necessarily sustainable growth, but it's something that we need to think about more. And, and this is not to be complacent at all, but when we look at other uh, UK cities, we can see a similar sort of decline in, in, in CO2 emissions. This is based on, on debt data. Sheffield it seems to be a, a non anomaly here. Uh, we don't, uh, we're not yet at the position where we have a sort of um, uh, carbon emissions uh, inventory at, at city level, apart from what's provided by debt data. And I think that's probably just a, a bit of an anomaly in the, in the debt data. But uh, you know, there is a there is a decline in CO2 emissions in UK cities. Um, as part of the work that we've been doing uh, through Step Up and all the you. All the uh, cities in Step Up have used Sankey diagrams to look at their, their use of energy uh, in mainly buildings, in industrial, uh, commercial, and residential buildings, and in road transport in terms of petroleum uh, products, just so that we can identify where we need to make energy savings. And in total, uh, Glasgow consumes about 12,500 gigawatts of energy uh, per annum. Um, 
But the more interesting stuff that we've been doing is based on the GIS mapping, which we work with Scottish Power Energy Networks and the University of Strathclyde on a sustainable energy action plan. So we've been mapping where that energy consumption is taking place, and you can see that con that concentration of energy consumption along Clyde, but particularly in the city centre. And then that leads us that geographical dimension to, to look at how we might need to have different uh, agendas and different strategies across different parts of the city. Glasgow wants to thrive economically. It's really important that we have uh, a secure, you know, supply of reasonably priced energy in the city centre for commercial and industrial regions, but also for the residences that are within uh, the city centre. And and then looking at the residential areas, and we've identified large energy consumers uh, that we need to work with, and we look, we're beginning to look a lot more at, at now as community. Uh, uh, generation of energy, uh, which um, the energy companies call distributed uh, generation or decentralised energy, you can call it. So, in the city centre, we have high density energy demand, we have building planning land use constraints, we have high utilisation of the existing infrastructure in terms of the electricity infrastructure, and there's a high cost of that new infrastructure. So, what do we need to do? We need to look at demand side management and energy efficiency within the city centre. We need to look at the planning policies. Uh, we need to align what we're doing on the sea app um, and identify the energy use there with where the new development is going to take place. And we're calling that integrated energy planning now. Um, and the policy needs to target areas. Um, and we need to engage with key stakeholders. So we're taking a very integrated planning approach there. How am I doing for time? You're fine. You've got another 10 minutes. OK, great. Um, and by identifying large energy consumers, similarly, we want to work through the Chamber of Commerce and other uh, trade bodies with those uh, uh, companies that uh, to encourage them to do more demand side management and energy efficiency. Um, and then we also want to include them in some of our proposed district heating networks. Um, so again, through the GIS mapping that we've been doing, uh, we're looking at where we've got um, uh, areas of energy uh, demand, we're looking at where we've got registered social landlords, uh, where we've got um, areas of deprivation, which are in the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. And then we're identifying the shady, grey shaded areas, areas where we've got existing district heating systems and expanding out from those, hopefully to cover some of the areas where we've got fuel poverty, but as you can see, we're not covering all of those areas. And um, so I think, you know, we feel certainly on district heating uh, is an area that we need to do a lot more on, but uh, in the future, and certainly we're not going to get to the levels of district heating uh, that they have in Denmark in, in particular, but we've used the opportunity of a review of the local development plan to look at where we would like to have district heating and to encourage developers, uh, new developers, to connect into existing district heating schemes where there are an areas of opportunity that we would identify, particularly in the city centre. There, we've got about uh, we've got large energy uh, consumers, large heat users within the city centre, um, and, and we want to, to have a distributed scheme in the, city, in the north of the city centre area. Um, so, for our energy and carbon master plan, um, uh, we are maintaining the same vision of, of Glasgow being one of the most sustainable cities in Europe, um, at 30, with a 30% CO2 savings target. The key challenge for us that's different to the CIP in 2010 is that to reduce electricity consumption for heating um, because uh, we want to reduce the carbon intensity of that and heating is uh, responsible for a large amount of CO2 emissions. So the enhanced plant stuff partnership approach have measures for energy efficiency, renewable energy, district heating, <coughs> smart grids. The new thing there is the energy services company which will take forward a lot of the district heating schemes sustainable transport, waste and waste water treatment. Uh, we know, yes, we've looked at the figures and Scottish water uh, is the biggest uh, emitter of, uh, of CO2. Um, and we want to have citizens and stakeholder involvement as well. Some of the things that we're doing is bringing together a lot of different areas. We have a set of people that sit on the floor below us that deal with um, municipal buildings. And there's more of them than there are of us dealing with the whole city-wide um, energy and CO2. Uh, but they're doing great work, but it's just on what the city council is responsible for in terms of its 2 percent or so buildings. But they're aligning the carbon management plan with our 30% reduction target. 
they're reducing carbon emissions from buildings through things like retrofitting buildings, high efficiency lighting, voltage and boiler optimization, more electric vehicles and LED street lighting. Um, in tertiary buildings, which is anything not municipal, um, we've been working with public sector partners on their own carbon reduction plans, and, and we've been using the heat mapping or energy mapping to identify large public and private sector energy consumers that we need to work with, and residential buildings, where we've done a lot of work already, but we don't control our housing stock anymore, um, but we've been working closely with the housing associations on energy efficiency and insulation retrofit in social housing specific team that's set up to do that. Our challenge is private housing actually pre-1919 uh, apartment buildings. Um, uh, tenement buildings. Um, local electricity production, uh, we're identifying the local development plan uh, that we will probably have another three sites uh, for wind turbines uh, that through supplementary guidance we will identify the precise locations where those turbines will go and how many there will be. But the one turbine that we have got at the African Barrett Brace, which is where the um, mountain biking uh, was during the Commonwealth Games, that's been very, very successful and actually uh, from the feeding tariff the local community is benefiting uh, financially from that. So the fault to the fault takes, we've been doing some work through the Future City to demonstrate to looking at the vast amount of vacant derelict land that there is in um, Glasgow where we can have ground like to use solar PV. And actually, interestingly, we're going to be looking at how we can design these using a, a sort of uh, design competition that we've got. So we can have probably the first of these ground mountains um, uh, solar voltaics in a, in a very nice and attractive design to try and get people switched on to them and, and, and accept them of them. But we are you know, working with local community groups and identifying local community groups near to the sites that we're identifying as being suitable for that. Energy from waste, heat pumps and microwave HEP, we're looking at all of those technologies district heating in those particular areas. The Athletes Village, Usain Bolt, was um, having his cup of tea with water supplied from the local um, district heating uh, from the energy centre there. So the 700 homes that are now being sold off half to the private sector and half going to a housing association where the athletes were during the Commonwealth Games. And then the ESCO is going to support the rollout of further district heating around the Athletes Village and those other areas. Um, the municipal fleet, uh, we want to reduce the numbers of uh, uh, vehicles that we're actually using in the county, the journal journeys, and we want to procure uh, the most efficient vehicles. And we're, we're procuring another 20 electric vehicles at the moment. This is called Matheson, who's the leader of the council. He likes electric vehicles. But he also launched the MAC um, cycle hire scheme as well, although I've not seen him on the yet. Um, and we've got these free charging points around the city as well. Um, uh, bus operators, there will be a couple of electric buses that will operate out of the city centre to the Riverside Museum very, very soon. Uh, and then we're promoting active travel, more cycling and walking, although I have to say that we bear no comparison to European cities in terms of mobile shift on, on that yet. Uh, and in terms of waste, we're uh, developing this new Glasgow Recycling and Renewable Energy Centre, which is going to divert 90% of green bit residual waste away from landfill, which will release recyclable resources and, and produce uh, heating to uh, nearby schemes. So, um, in summary, the, our new enhanced uh, sustainable e energy action plan will look at energy demand in the city, uh, will look at energy supply and, and efficiency, and it will look at how we can generate more renewable energy. Um, we will deliver that through the Sustainable Glasgow and the ESCO and the City Council itself. Uh, and there's a process that involves political leaders and our partners that we're working with. Uh, just finally, uh, since you are, some of you are planners, um, you know, we have had this coincidence of doing the energy master plan and being able to link that to a review of the local development plan. So this has just been out of consultation recently. And, and you know, again, just linking in that energy mapping that we've done, so you can see the demands on the city centre. We're able to link in, you know, what the solutions would be in each of these, and this is the way the plans are actually looking at, at a spatial dimension of development in terms of. So we have a resource management policy which is setting out energy efficiency, uh, low and zero carbon generating technologies. It's identifying opportunity areas for district heating, further sites for wind turbines, and then there's going to be more uh, supplementary guidance which will very much link into the sustainable energy action plan. 
I've mentioned already the City Technology uh, Platform. Um, so this is quite interesting because um, you know building your plan on, on data, it does need to be informed. The trouble with the debt data is two years out of date, although this is the release, the latest data just coming out today for 2012. But we want to actually get people to input their own energy consumption data. So those real-time events and how they're using cycling, you know, and any problems that they've got on the cycle path, that will go into this dashboard. Um, so there's different aspects of the city technology. Open data in Glasgow, if you want to look at that, it's openglasgow.uk. And we're already putting information on there. I think this is a bit supply-led at the moment, but things like our CO2 emission estimates, that's on there for the public to access. But in time, what we want to develop is more um, citizen input to that. So uh, another piece of work on the energy efficiency demonstration is developing this online energy model, which will be a 3D, 3D model. Model. And I think this will give you a fly through and look at how you know energy, this is electricity, actually is being consumed in different buildings and different parts of the city. Uh, Bonn have been there already for a long time working with the University of Bonn, but uh, in time I could see us being able to combine all these different data sets. Um, you know, looking at solar radiation, looking at heat emissions, looking at solar potential. Uh, actually, and, and developing something like this for Glasgow. Um, uh, just, I did say that I'd say from about stakeholder view, views, 90% of the people that we've surveyed uh, agree with Glasgow's energy pollution. So we're on the right lines with this agenda. Uh, half of them agree with the 30% CO2 reduction target, about 30% of them fully but should be more ambitious than that. And 70% are willing to share their energy data. So in terms of getting people to input to that, that's, uh, that's something that they want to do as well. And 80% of the organisations in Glasgow want to be involved. In terms of citizens' views, um, you know, we asked them about district heating, which I'm sure many of them wouldn't really understand. There was an ex somewhat of an explanation in the question but they would support district heating in their area, more than half of them would. And they want to see local review of energy projects, like waste of energy, CHP, and so on. And so, just in conclusion, I think you know cities are facing it. I think globally to the energy challenges of the future. Some are more advanced than others. I wouldn't say that Glasgow is particularly advanced, but the political leadership has taken this agenda and it's transforming the city through it as well. It wants to become more sustainable, smart, and resilient. The, the master plan is, a, I think, a key part tool in that process together with the future cities work and all the fellow resilient city work. Um, these are the things that really matter to them, fuel, fuel poverty, promoting uh, more creating jobs, but also promoting low carbon energy as well. And, and they have this vision of a smart green and more resilient Glasgow, which I think is, is very good. And they, those are just some uh, websites. Great, thank you. Thank you. 
I remember what we a point of view. So although uh, 
today really is very much about climate change. There's another C word which I think is really, really important, and that is contested. You know, a lot of these ideas are contested. I can hear Alex say, no, 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 there is no doubt. You know. I've never had any doubt about it. I've never had any doubt. No, no, I've never had any doubt it's being contested. The crucial rule number one, <laughs> the best science is built on skepticism. You have to ask questions. You have first. to ask questions. So, you know, there's another C word, which is about critical thinking, critical planning agendas, you know, critical thinking about this, the sorts of questions that we, we want to ask. Um, so please be prepared after we've heard our, our third speaker to ask some challenging questions of the experts. So here are just a few of our wayward audience. Apologies. <laughs> and I think out of courtesy to you, we will, we will just wait for, for Grace, who's coming back. But does anybody have any, any questions of, of Alex just whilst we're waiting? Be unfair to ask Katie because she hasn't <laughs> given us the benefit of her ideas. Uh, 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 Alex, it's probably going to be a bit of a uh, slightly stupid, naive question. But These are the best ones. Right. Well, usually I'm, 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 good, I'm good at asking stupid questions. Yes. Uh, but the, the, the world the world's obviously been a lot hotter in the past yes. uh, than it is right now. It yes. is right now, and it also perhaps is predicted to be in the next. 50 odd years. Mm -hmm. So, what, what's the problem? Why, why are we trying to? Why are we trying to resist climate change? Okay, two things. things. Um, you go back far enough. Yes, you're right. The world was hotter uh, in lots of different ways. The problem is the, the continents were also in different places. Right. They're not comparing like with like. Is the simplest answer to your question. Um, you go back to sort of dinosaur era and that sort of thing, which is what 55, you know, way back Jurassic, pre Jurassic stuff. That kind of paleo climatology. There's lots of reasons for that. Different people. Different flora, different people. Fauna. Again, you know, <laughs> continents in different places make a huge difference. The more reasons you have, the, the way your climate changes. So it's not, the argument is not around um, the being here before, because we certainly have, even, even during the Jurassic time, we, did, we didn't have more than part per billion carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's not, you've got to remember this is a, an interlinked discipline. It's not just about carbon. Uh, all the infrastructure of the planet, which is essentially 